The Discourses of Epictetus Translated by George Long Book 3 Chapter 26 To Those Who Fear Want Are you not ashamed at being more cowardly and more mean than fugitive slaves? How do they when they run away leave their masters? On what estates do they depend, and what domestics do they rely on? Do they not after stealing a little which is enough for the first days, then afterwards move on through land or through sea, contriving one method after another for maintaining their lives? And what fugitive slave ever died of hunger? But you are afraid lest necessary things should fail you, and are sleepless by night. Wretch, are you so blind, and don't you see the road to which the want of necessaries leads? Well, where does it lead? To the same place to which a fever leads, or a stone that falls on you, to death. Have you not often said this yourself to your companions? Have you not read much of this kind, and written much? And how often have you boasted that you were easy as to death? Yes, but my wife and children also suffer hunger. Well then, does their hunger lead to any other place? Is there not the same descent to some place for them also? Is not there the same state below for them? Do you not choose then to look to that place full of boldness against every want and deficiency, to that place to which both the richest and those who have held the highest offices, and kings themselves, and tyrants must descend? Or to which you will descend hungry, if it should so happen, but they burst by indigestion and drunkenness? What beggar did you hardly ever see who was not an old man, and even of extreme old age? But chilled with cold, day and night, and lying on the ground, and eating only what is absolutely necessary, they approach near to the impossibility of dying. Cannot you write? Cannot you teach, take care of, children? Cannot you be a watchman at another person's door? But it is shameful to come to such a necessity. Learn then first what are the things which are shameful, and then tell us that you are a philosopher, but at present do not, even if any other man call you so, allow it. Is that not shameful to you which is not your own act, that of which you are not the cause, that which has come to you by accident, as a headache, as a fever? If your parents were poor, and left their property to others, and if while they live they do not help you at all, is this shameful to you? Is this what you learned with the philosophers? Did you never hear that the thing which is shameful ought to be blamed, and that which is blamable is worthy of blame? Whom do you blame for an act, which is not his own, which he did not do himself? Did you then make your father such as he is, or is it in your power to improve him? Is this power given to you? Well then, ought you to wish the things which are not given to you, or to be ashamed if you do not obtain them? And have you also been accustomed while you were studying philosophy to look to others and to hope for nothing from yourself? Lament then and groan and eat with fear that you may not have food tomorrow. Tremble about your poor slaves lest they steal, lest they run away, lest they die. So live, and continue to live, you who in name only have approached philosophy, and have disgraced its theorems as far as you can by showing them to be useless and unprofitable to those who take them up. You who have never sought constancy, freedom from perturbation, and from passions, you who have not sought any person for the sake of this object, but many for the sake of syllogisms, you who have never thoroughly examined any of these appearances by yourself. Am I able to bear, or am I not able to bear? What remains for me to do? But as if all your affairs were well and secure, you have been resting on the third topic, 
that of things being unchanged, in order that you may possess unchanged, what? Cowardice, mean spirit, the admiration of the rich, desire without attaining any end, and avoidance, acklesson, which fails in the attempt. About security in these things you have been anxious. Ought you not to have gained something in addition from reason, and then to have protected this with security? And whom did you ever see building a battlement all round and not encircling it with a wall? And what doorkeeper is placed with no door to watch? But you practice in order to be able to prove, what? You practice that you may not be tossed as on the sea through sophisms, and tossed about from what? Show me first what you hold, what you measure, or what you weigh, and show me the scales or the medimnus, the measure, or how long will you go on measuring the dust? Ought you not to demonstrate those things which make men happy, which make things go on for them in the way as they wish, and why we ought to blame no man, accuse no man, and acquiesce in the administration of the universe? Show me these. See? I show them, I will resolve syllogisms for you. This is the measure, slave, but it is not the thing measured. Therefore you are now paying the penalty for what you neglected, philosophy, you tremble, you lie awake, you advise with all persons, and if your deliberations are not likely to please all, you think that you have deliberated ill. Then you fear hunger, as you suppose, but it is not hunger that you fear, but you are afraid that you will not have a cook, that you will not have another to purchase provisions for the table, a third to take off your shoes, a fourth to dress you, others to rub you, and to follow you, in order that in the bath, when you have taken off your clothes and stretched yourself out like those who are crucified, you may be rubbed on this side and on that, and then the elliptes, rubber, may say, to the slave. Change his position, Present the side, take hold of his head, show the shoulder, and then when you have left the bath and gone home, you may call out, does no one bring something to eat? And then, take away the tables, sponge them, you are afraid of this, that you may not be able to lead the life of a sick man. But learn the life of those who are in health, how slaves live, how laborers, how those live, who are genuine philosophers, how Socrates lived, who had a wife and children, how Diogenes lived, and how Cleanthes who attended to the school and drew water. If you choose to have these things, you will have them everywhere, and you will live in full confidence. Confiding in what? In that alone in which a man can confide, in that which is secure, in that which is not subject to hindrance, in that which cannot be taken away, that is, in your own will. And why have you made yourself so useless and good for nothing that no man will choose to receive you into his house, no man to take care of you? But if the utensil entire and useful were cast abroad, every man who found it would take it up and think it again, but no man will take you up, and every man will consider you a loss. So cannot you discharge the office even of a dog or of a cock? Why then do you choose to live any longer? when you are what you are. Does any good man fear that he shall fail to have food? To the blind it does not fail, to the lame it does not, shall it fail to a good man? And to a good soldier there does not fail to be one who gives him pay, nor to a laborer, nor to a shoemaker, and to the good man shall there be wanting such a person? Does God thus neglect the things that he has established, his ministers, his witnesses, whom alone he employs as examples to the uninstructed, both that he exists, and administers well the whole, and does not neglect human affairs, and that to a good man there is no evil either when he is living or when he is dead? What then when he does not supply him with food? What else does he do, than like a good general, he has given me the signal to retreat? I obey, I follow, assenting to the words of the commander, praising his acts, for I came when it pleased him, and I will also go away when it pleases him. And 
While I lived, it was my duty to praise God both by myself and to each person severally and to many. He does not supply me with many things, nor with abundance, he does not will me to live luxuriously, for neither did he supply Hercules who was his own son. But another, Eurystheus, was king of Argos and Mycenae, and Hercules obeyed orders, and labored, and was exercised. And Eurystheus was what he was, neither king of Argos nor of Mycenae, for he was not even king of himself, but Hercules was ruler and leader of the whole earth and sea, who purged away lawlessness and introduced justice and holiness, and he did these things both naked and alone. And when Ulysses was cast out shipwrecked, did want humiliate him, did it break his spirit? But how did he go off to the virgins to ask for necessaries, to beg which is considered most shameful? As a lion bred in the mountains, trusting in his strength. Odyssey 6 130 Relying on what? Not on reputation, nor on wealth, nor on the power of a magistrate, but on his own strength, that is, on his opinions about the things which are in our power and those which are not. For these are the only things which make men free which make them escape from hindrance, which raise the head, neck, of those who are depressed, which make them look with steady eyes on the rich and on tyrants. And this was, is, the gift given to the philosopher. But you will not come forth bold, but trembling about your trifling garments and silver vessels. Unhappy man, have you thus wasted your time till now? What then, if I shall be sick? You will be sick in such a way as you ought to be. Dot, who will take care of me? God, your friends, I shall lie down on a hard bed. But you will lie down like a man. Dot, I shall not have a convenient chamber. You will be sick in an inconvenient chamber who will provide for me the necessary food. Those who provide for others also. You will be sick like manes. And what also will be the end of the sickness? Any other than death? Do you then consider that this the chief of all evils to man and the chief mark of mean spirit and of cowardice is not death, but rather the fear of death? Against this fear, then I advise you to exercise yourself. To this, let all your reasoning tend, your exercises, and reading, and you will know that thus only are men made free. Book 4 Chapter 1 Part 1 About Freedom He is free who lives as he wishes to live, who is neither subject to compulsion nor to hindrance, nor to force, whose movements to action, or my, are not impeded, whose desires attain their purpose, and who does not fall into that which he would avoid. Ecclesiastes Aperiptitoi. Who then chooses to live in error? No man. Who chooses to live deceived, liable to mistake, unjust, unrestrained, discontented, mean? No man. Not one then of the bad lies as he wishes, nor is he then free. And who chooses to live in sorrow, fear, envy, pity, desiring and failing in his desires, attempting to avoid something and falling into it? Not one. Do we then find any of the bad free from sorrow, free from fear, who does not fall into that which he would avoid, and does not obtain that which he wishes? Not one, nor then do we find any bad man free. If then a man who has been twice consul should hear this, if you add, but you are a wise man, this is nothing to you, he will pardon you. But if you tell him the truth, and say, you differ not at all from those who have been thrice sold as to being yourself not a slave, 
what else ought you to expect than blows? For he says, What, I a slave, I whose father was free, whose mother was free. I whom no man can purchase. I am also of senatorial rank, and a friend of Caesar, and I have been a consul, and I own many slaves. In the first place, most excellent senatorial man, perhaps your father also was a slave in the same kind of servitude, and your mother, and your grandfather, and all your ancestors in an ascending series. But even if they were as free as it is possible, what is this to you? What if they were of a noble nature, and you of a mean nature, if they were fearless, and you a coward, if they had the power of self-restraint, and you are not able to exercise it? And what, you may say, has this to do with being a slave? Does it seem to you to be nothing to do a thing unwillingly, with compulsion, with groans, has this nothing to do with being a slave? It is something, you say, but who is able to compel me, except the Lord of all, Caesar? Then even you yourself have admitted that you have one master. But that he is the common master of all, as you say, let not this console you at all, but know that you are a slave and a great family. So also the people of Nicopolis are used to exclaim, by the fortune of Caesar, we are free. However, if you please, let us not speak of Caesar at present. But tell me this, did you never love any person, a young girl, or slave, or free? What then is this with respect to being a slave or free? Were you never commanded by the person beloved to do something which you did not wish to do? Have you never flattered your little slave? Have you never kissed her feet? And yet if any man compelled you to kiss Caesar's feet, you would think it an insult and excessive tyranny. What else then is slavery? Did you never go out by night to some place whither you did not wish to go? Did you not expend that you did not wish to expend? Did you not utter words with sighs and groans? Did you not submit to abuse and to be excluded? But if you are ashamed to confess your own acts, see what Thracenide says and does, who having seen so much military service as perhaps not even you have, first of all went out by night, when Geta, a slave, does not venture out, but if he were compelled by his master would have cried out much and would have gone out lamenting his bitter slavery. Next, what does Thracenide say? A worthless girl has enslaved me, me whom no enemy ever did. Unhappy man, who are the slave even of a girl, and a worthless girl. Why then do you still call yourself free? And why do you talk of your service in the army? Then he calls for a sword and is angry with him who out of kindness refuses it, and he sends presents to her who hates him, and entreats and weeps, and on the other hand having had a little success he is elated. But even then how? Was he free enough neither to desire nor to fear? Now consider in the case of animals, how we employ the notion of liberty. Men keep tame lions shut up, and feed them, and some take them about. And who will say that this lion is free? Is it not the fact that the more he lives at his ease, so much, the more he is in a slavish condition? And, and who if he had perception and reason would wish to be one of these lions? Well, these birds when they are caught and are kept shut up, how much do they suffer in their attempts to escape? And some of them die of hunger rather than submit to such a kind of life. And as, as many of them as live, hardly live, and with suffering, pine away, and if they ever find any opening, they make their escape. So much do they desire their natural liberty, and to be independent and free from hindrance. And what harm is there to you in this? What do you say? I am formed by nature to fly where I choose, to live in the open air, to sing when I choose, you deprive me of all this and say, what harm is it to you? 
For this reason we shall say that those animals only are free which cannot endure capture, but as soon as they are caught escape from captivity by death. So Diogenes also somewhere says that there is only one way to freedom, and that is to die, content, and he writes to the Persian king. You cannot enslave the Athenian state any more than you can enslave fishes. How is that? Cannot I catch them? If you catch them, says Diogenes, they will immediately leave you, as fishes do, for if you catch a fish, it dies, and if these men that are caught shall die, of what use to you is the preparation for war? These are the words of a free man who had carefully examined the thing, and, as was natural, had discovered it. But if you look for it in a different place from where it is, what wonder if you never find it? The slave wishes to be set free immediately. Why? Do you think that he wishes to pay money to the collectors of twentieths? No, but because he imagines that hitherto, through not having obtained this, he is hindered and unfortunate. If I shall be set free, immediately it is all happiness, I care for no man, I speak to all as an equal and like to them, I go where I choose, I come from any place I choose, and go where I choose. Then he is set free, and forth with having no place where he can eat, he looks for some man to flatter, someone with whom he shall sup, then he either works with his body and endures the most dreadful things, and if he can obtain a manger, he falls into a slavery much worse than his former slavery. Or even if he has become rich, being a man without any knowledge of what is good, he loves some little girl, and in his unhappiness laments and desires to be a slave again. He says, What evil did I suffer in my state of slavery? Another clothed me, another supplied me with shoes, another fed me, another looked after me in sickness, and I did only a few services for him. But now a wretched man, what things I suffer, being a slave to many instead of to one. But however, he says, if I shall acquire rings, then I shall live most prosperously and happily. First, in order to acquire these rings, he submits to that which he is worthy of, then when he has acquired them, it is again all the same. Then he says, if I shall be engaged in military service, I am free from all evils. He obtains military service. He suffers as much as a flogged slave, and nevertheless, he asks for a second service and a third. After this, when he has put the finishing stroke, the colophon, to his career, and has become a senator, then he becomes a slave by entering into the assembly, then he serves the finer and most splendid slavery, not to be a fool, but to learn what Socrates taught what is the nature of each thing that exists. And that a man should not rashly adapt preconceptions, prolepsius, to the several things which are. For this is the cause to men of all their evils, the not being able to adapt the general preconceptions to the several things. But we have different opinions about the cause of our evils. One man thinks that he is sick, not so however, but the fact is that he does not adapt his preconceptions right. Another thinks that he is poor, another that he has a severe father or mother, and another again that Caesar is not favorable to him. But all this is one and only one thing, the not knowing how to adapt the preconceptions. For who is not a preconception of that which is bad, that it is hurtful, that it ought to be avoided, that it ought in every way to be guarded against? One preconception is not repugnant to another, only where it comes to the matter of adaptation. What then is this evil, which is both hurtful, and a thing to be avoided? He answers, not to be Caesar's friend. He has gone far from the mark, he has missed the adaptation, he is embarrassed, he seeks the things which are not at all pertinent to the matter, for when he has succeeded in being Caesar's friend, Nevertheless he has failed in finding what he sought. For what is that which every man seeks? To live secure, to be happy, to do everything as he wishes, not to be hindered, nor compelled. 
When then he is become the friend of Caesar, is he free from hindrance? Free from compulsion? Is he tranquil, is he happy? Of whom shall we inquire? What more trustworthy witness have we than this very man who has become Caesar's friend? Come forward and tell us when did you sleep more quietly, now or before you became Caesar's friend? Immediately you hear the answer, Stop, I entreat you, and do not mock me, you know not what miseries I suffer, and sleep does not come to me, but one comes and says, Caesar is already awake, he is now going forth, then come troubles and cares. Well, when did you sup with more pleasure, now or before? Hear what he says about this also. He says that if he is not invited, he is pained, and if he is invited, he sups like a slave with his master, all the while being anxious that he does not say or do anything foolish. And what do you suppose that he is afraid of, lest he should be lashed like a slave? How can he expect anything so good? No, but as befits so great a man, Caesar's friend, he is afraid that he may lose his head. And when did you bathe more free from trouble, and take your gymnastic exercise more quietly? In fine, which kind of life did you prefer? Your present or your former life? I can swear that no man is so stupid or so ignorant of truth as not to bewail his own misfortunes the nearer he is in friendship to Caesar. Since then neither those who are called kings live as they choose, nor the friends of kings, who finally are those who are free. Seek, and you will find, for you have aids from nature for the discovery of truth. But if you are not able yourself by going along these ways only to discover that which follows, listen to those who have made the inquiry. What do they say? Does freedom seem to you a good thing? The greatest good. Is it possible then that he who obtains the greatest good can be unhappy or fare badly? No. Whomsoever then you shall see unhappy, unfortunate, lamenting, confidently declare that they are not free. I do declare it. We have now then got away from buying and selling and from such arrangements about matters of property, for if you have rightly assented to these matters. If the great king, the Persian king, is unhappy, he cannot be free, nor can a little king, nor a man of consular rank, nor one who has been twice consul. Be it so. Further then answer me this question also, does freedom seem to you to be something great and noble and valuable? How should it not seem so? Is it possible then when a man obtains anything so great and valuable and noble to be mean? It is not possible. When then you see any man subject to another or flattering him contrary to his own opinion, confidently affirm that this man also is not free, and not only if he do this for a bit of supper, but also if he does it for a government, province, or a consulship. And call these men little slaves who for the sake of little matters do these things, and those who do so for the sake of great things call great slaves, as they deserve to be dot, this is admitted also. Do you think that freedom is a thing independent and self-governing? Certainly. Whomsoever then it is in the power of another to hinder and compel, declare that he is not free. And do not look, I entreat you, after his grandfathers and great-grandfathers, or inquire about his being bought or sold, but if you hear him saying from his heart and with feeling, Master, even if the twelve fasces precede him, as consul, call him a slave. And if you hear him say, Wretch that I am, how much I suffer, call him a slave. If finally you see him lamenting, complaining, unhappy, Call him a slave, though he wears a pretexta. If then he is doing nothing of this kind, do not yet say that he is free, but learn his opinions, whether they are subject to compulsion, or may produce hindrance, or to bad fortune, and if you find him such, call him a slave who has a holiday in the Saturnalia, say that his master is from home. 
He will return soon, and you will know what he suffers. Who will return? Whoever has in himself the power over anything which is desired by the man either to give it to him or to take it away. Thus then have we many masters? We have, for we have circumstances as masters prior to our present masters, and these circumstances are many. Therefore it must of necessity be that those who have the power over any of these circumstances must be our masters. For no man fears Caesar himself, but he fears death, banishment, deprivation of his property, prison, and disgrace. Nor does any man love Caesar, unless Caesar is a person of great merit, but he loves wealth, the office of tribune, praetor, or consul. We love, and hate, and fear these things, it must be that those who have the power over them must be our masters. Therefore we adore them even as gods, for we think that what possesses the power of conferring the greatest advantage on us is divine. Then we wrongly assume, you Potosimon, that a certain person has the power of conferring the greatest advantages, therefore he is something divine. For if we wrongly assume that a certain person has the power of conferring the greatest advantages, it is a necessary consequence that the conclusion from these premises must be false. Thank you.